Hello, welcome everyone to the 20th Annual Wine Garden Disability Symposium. I'm Rashmi Kumar. I work at the Wine Garden Center. My work embraces the ethos of STEM learning, STEM advising, and pretty much everything related to STEM fields. I'm excited to moderate the session with my fabulous colleague, Darius McInnes. And Darius is so fabulous that he has initiated numerous collaborations with colleagues across the Penn campus. A closed caption is available at the bottom left of the screen for anyone interested. And now about Wine Garden, a bit about the symposium. Wine Garden did want to hold this disability symposium as it has done in the past in person, but well, we do hope that next year we'll be able to welcome you in person at the Houston Hall on the Penn campus. The Wine Garden falls under the division of University Life and the center encompasses three areas, academic support, tutoring services, and disability services. The center works with students in all 12 schools on the Penn campus. So we do, you know, work and cater to many kinds of requests from different parts of the campus. And we are, we constantly keep in awaiting how we do work and how we reach out. Complete details of the symposium and the presentations are available on the Wine Garden website. I encourage everyone to check them. Today's presentation is titled Access versus Content, Contemporary Lens on Disability Equity Beyond the Litigious Accommodation. Uh, the presenter is Kate Fialski and she is a lifelong disability advocate and works in the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University's College of Education and Human Development. For your um, benefit, the presenter will accept questions at the end of the presentation. However, you don't have to wait. Put your questions in the Q&A during the presentation, and we will monitor the Q&A as you post your questions and comments. And finally, the slides recorded presentation and resources mentioned in the presentation will be available via the Wengarten website. Um, it will take us a few days or a week to ensure the accuracy of the recording, and then we will post everything. So I'm going to turn it to Kate. Kate, it's all yours now. Hi, Rashmi. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Aaron Spector and everyone at the Weingartner Center for inviting me to present today. I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. Um, I should say for the audience who is with us that I'm a middle-aged white presenting female with short red hair and freckles. I'm proud to have a disability identity and to be part of a vibrant disability community. Now, in this, um, in this time, I'm going to use a bit of time to offer some background and context for how I come to hold certain perspectives. And I'm trying to leave a good amount of time at the end so that um, we can engage in more conversation and you have an opportunity to ask questions. So to start, a little history and a reflection. 
We know that prior to the 1970s, individuals with disabilities could be denied admissions to colleges and universities based on their disability status. Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1971 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 open the doors to higher education. It's important to note that the Rehab Act established persons with disabilities as a collective, a protected class. Not only did these laws prohibit admissions discrimination, but based on disability status, they also require institutions to make physical changes to campus, buildings, classrooms, and the modalities of content access. By modalities, I mean, for example, e-reader accessibility for documents, note-taking options such as audio recordings and peer note-takers, things like that. Over the last decades, we've seen the statistics on higher ed disclosure increase. According to the National Center for Disability Statistics, 20% of undergraduates reported having a disability in 2019, as compared to a mere 6% reporting a disability in 1995. This is not to say necessarily that more students have a disability. I don't think we can say that. But we do know that more students report a disability. And the new number is closer to the overall number reported by the CDC when shifted for age peers. We could say that this is an indicator of progress, and we may draw the conclusion that disability discrimination is abating on college campuses. But let's not get carried away and declare total victory. In a 2017 report, the National Center for College Students with Disabilities, and now I'm going to flip on my slides so that you can, uh, you can read along with this with me. One moment. So in the 2017 report, the National Center for College Students with Disabilities noted that, as this slide says, even after addressing physical and structural barriers, the campus environment may be inhospitable for students, faculty, and staff with disabilities due to ableist attitudes about disability, as well as curricular, programmatic, and policy barriers. This same report highlighted a 10-point difference in overall feeling of welcoming by students with disabilities compared to non-disabled peers. And a 16% 16 point difference, 33.7% versus 17%, a 16-point difference for students with disabilities reporting that they have experienced exclusionary, intimidating, offensive, or hostile experiences on campus. These numbers were reported pre-pandemic, and I offer my opinion that the pandemic has really been an inflection point for many. Many of us are asking questions about what we're willing to accept or tolerate in our environment. And I think this is a question that's really relevant. Where are we drawing the line and what are we willing to tolerate? There's been a progression of ideas like the 1980s idea, like it or leave it, suck it up. And in 2000, we saw this new mantra, see something, say something. That was a mantra related to 9-11. But in the wake of 2006 Me Too movement, see something, say something meant something completely different. And 2008, stand your ground, becomes reconfigured in 2016 as a symbol of justice and speaking truth to power. This image depicted on this slide is the image that I think is really iconic and symbolic from Baton Rouge, where a woman is standing proudly like justice, like the statue of justice, as two fully armed military guys are rushing up to her and she stands her ground. These movements have really reconfigured what our ideas are, what we're willing to tolerate, and, and in that tolerating, what are we doing? Do we have a responsibility for each other? 
One of the most recent additions to this is in 2016, Lawrence Carter, Carter Long created essays about this new hashtag, hashtag say the word, hashtag disabled. And so we're in a new era where movements are organic and they are learning from each other. And the collective of disability movements is learning and changes as we speak. When we combine the 1970s disability as a class from the Rehab Act with ideas such as Black Lives Matter and disability culture embracing the idea of stand your ground, which shifts the conversation from my secret individual accommodation to a proud collective demand for recognition that disability is a class, a culture, and an identity. Yes, Lawrence Carter Long's Say the Word and Hashtag Disabled follow gay pride, which led the way reclaiming a stigmatized term. And many students with disabilities are proudly using disability as part of their identity. Following in the wake of the non-binary movement, disability culture is embracing all of self versus false, reductive, and binary depictions. So what does this look like in practical terms in higher ed? What does this mean to changes that we're experiencing, things that we're seeing? Now, this is my observation, and I don't have any research based on this, but I've noticed this great shift that is happening. The conversation about disability is changing on campus. More students are visibly and vocally self-identifying as disabled, and on this slide, I capitalized disabled, capital D, meaning disability identity. More students are leading conversations about disability meaning making, extrapolating from queer theory and critical race theory. More students are refusing to be relegated to the role of others, such as outsider artists, patients, research subjects, therapy clients. More students are participating with agency in control of representations of disability and demanding economic benefits as owners of these representations, influencers, brands themselves, aggregators and distribution channels. And more students are refusing the binary of disabled and are really seeing themselves in intersectional multicultural modes black and queer and disabled, white and gay and disabled, trans and autistic. The seismic shift in disability discourse creates a number of questions for higher ed and for the idea of departments that are called something like disability resources. If we acknowledge that students with disabilities are no longer relegated to the object of our professional action, that people with disabilities become colleagues. How does this move from them to us demand changes in the classroom? How must we change our examples? So for example, students with autism without accommodations in a classroom may hear a lecturer speak about good educational programs for children with autism and all of those examples are segregated settings using ABA. Now, I'm not making any statement about the settings or about ABA in this presentation, but what I am saying is students with autism seeing these representations are beginning to ask questions about the spectrum of representation and why aren't we using other representations as well. We have to change the discourse also inside the classroom in the content. How do we include examples of people with disability as authors of their own work? Disability represented as a social justice issue versus something about therapy and interventions. And how must we address the language we use in the classroom? Often in classrooms, we're talking about historic language and in particular fields, we may be still engaging with that historic language. So what efforts should we make to identify harmfulness of language? So I want to share an example with you. 
Um, the Digital Public Library of America, DPLA, has its own statement on potentially harmful content. And this is happening across library systems. And I think that there's something here for us to learn from. In this case, and I'm going to read part of their statement, the Digital Public Library of America, DPLA, is a portal to millions of freely available items from thousands of libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural heritage organizations across the United States. DPLA contains some content that may be harmful or difficult to view. Our cultural heritage partners collect materials from history, as well as artifacts from many cultures and time periods. As a result, some of the materials presented here may reflect outdated, biased, offensive, and possibly violent views and opinions due to pervasive systemic intolerance. In addition, some cultural heritage institutions collect and preserve materials relating to violent or graphic events which are preserved for their historical significance. I'm going to give you a minute if you're reading the slide. I think that it's really fascinating the language that DPA, DPLA chose to use in this example. There aren't any euphemisms in here. And instead of just saying that something may be difficult or you may have difficulty seeing it or reading it, they reflect this view that it could be possibly violent views and opinions. And they use language like pervasive systemic intolerance. There has been a trend across library systems to really um, struggle with and articulate the difficulties inherent in the collection and the histories that are presented. I have not seen the same kind of shift happening in classrooms, but maybe you have, and I would love to hear about it if you have something that you'd like to write or a question you'd like to write in the Q&A. So in addition to that, another question is, what efforts do we need to make in the classroom regarding the use of things like ableist language. Mm, this perspective is crazy. That student is lazy. And when students come to talk to us about discrimination in the classroom, this may be about content and not access. So what procedures do we have in place for this? And what's our role in these conversations? So here are some of the questions that I've asked in this presentation, and I want to restate them here in a list. And if you have examples for these, please use one of these to acknowledge that you may have an example. If you have a link that you want to share or anything that you want to put in the Q&A, please do it now. So I am seeing these changes in student self-identification. I don't know how broadly this is, and I haven't seen any research that is happening in this area. One of the difficulties in disability research has been that disability um, is a fluid. It is what is considered a non-stable research item. Um, how you define it for the question can change the answers that, that participants, research participants may, may select. I think it's interesting to note that in public policy, there's about 67 different definitions of disability. So it's no wonder that it makes it difficult to do research. But I think even without the research, we have to acknowledge that there may be changes in student self-identification and that perhaps we're moving away from accommodations only language and something that is more about disability pride and disability culture. If we, again, as I mentioned before, if we acknowledge that students with disabilities are no longer relegated to the object of our professional action, that people with disabilities are colleagues, how does this move from them to us demand changes in the classroom? We can't keep talking about the 
them as if they are remote and somewhere outside the classroom and not participants in the conversation. What efforts do we need to make in the classroom regarding the use of ableist language and assumptions? And I know that there have been many attempts to have trigger warnings in classrooms. If you Google trigger warnings in higher ed, for example, you will receive a number of different articles and perspectives. Some of these are, are statements that are um, more aligned with the comments I said in the beginning in the 1980s, suck it up mode. You know, a classroom's going to have difficult content. You have to sit there and suck it up and, and intake that difficult content. But is that true today? Is that true in our expectations of students in a classroom? I think today we're expecting more from students in the classroom, and students are certainly more vocal in their commentary. And again, as I mentioned, so when students come to talk to us about discrimination in the classroom, this may be about content and not access. So are we prepared to address it? Is this our role? Now, one additional thought here. So some of the ways that we address what's happening in the classroom, I think everyone um, who is participating in this webinar or watching it afterwards, you've certainly heard of universal design for learning. And as we teach universal design for learning, and as we try to implement universal design for learning, a lot of that has been about access modalities. We plan for how will students participating in this have access to captions, for example. How will students who may be blind or low vision have access to the visual content that is provided? And universal design for learning is built around the idea that we should be considering all of our audiences and how to remove barriers for full participation. Often in the conversations about barriers to full participation, we are talking about these concrete modes of access. But we haven't really had conversations about the fact that some of the discourse itself is not welcoming. Some of the content itself is not welcoming. And so how do we make a shift from merely talking about access and modalities to really, as institutes of higher education, to addressing the cultural aspects that are inhibitors to students, faculty, and staff with disabilities feeling welcomed on campus. One of the other ways that we've done this is that we have educational programs such as diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that talk about cultural education. And those programs are really fantastic. But often, disability is left out of these conversations as disability continues to be redirected to specialized departments and treated as a litigious minimum. So my question is really for all of us to consider how do we make a shift in praxis, both in what we're doing in universal design for learning and also, what are we doing in our diversity, equity, and inclusion education? And how do we make a shift? So what I'd like to do first, it's very difficult um, to be looking at slides the whole time while a speaker is talking. And so I wanna move off of the slides and just come back to you um, as an audience. Um, the question that I'm asking in this presentation is really what is our obligation to creating a welcoming environment and how do we move beyond um, the work that we're doing in access, which we absolutely, absolutely must do. In addition to that work, how do we move to the next level and, and how do we engage in the content presentation itself? 
what I'm offering to you is I think that really the library systems are some of the systems that are leading the way in, in recognition of the content, in recognition of some of the history of the field, in recognition of the reality of people who are using the content, maybe perceiving the content themselves. And so that's what I offer to you in this presentation is really a conversation of not stopping the work on access, including the work on access, but also beginning to have conversations about the content and engaging the students who are in a very new place in self-identification, disability pride, intersectionality, and the expectation of self being more inclusive than a mere binary. So I'm watching the time. I was hoping to leave half the time also for a conversation with you as the audience. So I'd really like to take some questions. Um, and I, you guys could really help me out by putting some questions on the Q&A board. Megan, thank you so much. Megan, I'm going to read the Q&A. Um, thank you very much for sending something on the board. I think incorporating the levels of disabilities into the designing process of each architectural development of the school and curriculum is a great way to make disabled students feel welcomed. What I mean by this is like having high tables in classrooms. Thank you for that. Thank you for that commentary on architectural welcoming also. Um, yes, so in some centers, what we've seen happening is a different movement instead of the traditional table, chair, conference room type of configuration, we have seen a change that just says all are welcome here. Um, and as you suggest, that sign, those symbols of all are welcome here, can even be in the furniture that we choose. So it's not just that um, it is a, an accommodation, if you will, for a specific individual, but by having multiple types of chairs, soft chairs, hard chairs, chairs with handles, different heights, tables of different heights, it's saying that the room is expecting different configurations of bodies to be entering the room. And the room is saying to us, you are welcomed here, just by demonstrating in that, that in the configuration of the space. So yes, that's a great example of moving beyond an individual accommodation into being able to demonstrate more welcoming. Megan um, Owens, I see your question. Thank you for your question. What sort of research do you think we need to move forward? I think that, um, first of all, we need research that is um, participatory action research. So we need students with disabilities, faculty with disabilities, staff with disabilities, to be active in creating the research rather than um, merely being participants in the research. Um, another factor of the research is often when we're conducting research, we have questions at the beginning that are that are selection boxes, that we choose demographics. Um, do you have a disability? Yes or no. How do you self-identify? Um, and so often the way that those sentences are constructed, they're constructed to force a binary. I have a disability or I don't have a disability. Well, for some people, a disability can be situational. And so if the environment is right, then um, I don't have any particular impairment that needs to be mitigated. Um, and so it can 
Disability can also appear as a when or a maybe or a sometimes instead of an always or just when I'm filling out this research. So I think there are two big changes that I would recommend in terms of the research that would be more inclusive of people with disabilities and representative of the reality of our shift in body minds as in relation to an environment. Um, Rebecca, I see your question, thank you. I recently had a student who identifies as autistic ask whether it would be possible to have professors use more concrete language in the classroom. Have you seen anything like this? Yes, I've heard this from some students um, who are autistic. Um, for some students, they also use the capital A, autistic as an identity and as a culture. Um, so uh, for some students and not just students with autism, um, but for some students, some students are looking for more concrete information. Um, and to be clear, when are you asking a question? When are you making a statement? Sometimes in the way that we speak, we raise our voice with a question mark at the end, implying that there is a question, but there is no real question. So sometimes the way that we signal as instructors can be confusing for students. I can confess that as an instructor, I have confused my own students. One of the things that's helped me as an instructor is um, when I'm doing online, when I'm doing online education, having the transcripts turned on. And so having the transcripts turned on, even if students are not requesting transcripts, Sometimes seeing the language written down helps remove some of the vagaries of vocal communication. Um, if you'd like to ask further questions about that, Rebecca, I'd be really happy to answer them. Um, another question on the Q&A. From your perspective, does making colleges and universities welcoming to students with mental health disabilities pose particular challenges. I ask because there continues to be significant shame and stigma relative to mental health disabilities as compared to other disability identities. First, I want to um, acknowledge what this, is, what this question is saying. Um, this question is saying that there is a hierarchy of disability and research has actually found that yes, there is a hierarchy of disability. Individuals who have an acquired disability are considered higher in the hierarchy, that that is considered more acceptable and less stigmatized. Um, and individuals with physical disability have less stigma as compared to individuals with intellectual or mental health disabilities. This is based on, on, on numerous research reports conducted on disability, disability hierarchies, and stigma. And, and it has continued across time, even though our understanding of disability continues to evolve. Um, so I'm not really sure about the part of the question that is, um, does making colleges welcoming pose particular challenges um, for students with mental health disabilities? I think that part of what we know about students in higher ed is that in general, students in higher ed, graduate students and undergraduate students are going through a great deal of stress and anxiety. And whether or not they have a, a di specific diagnosis we know that students are navigating these things, whether it's navigating transition to the higher ed environment, leaving home for the first time, the stress of the academic pressures, competition, whatever. And so um, in my experience, um, universities overall are trying to provide more um, resources of various sorts for students um, students with mental health disabilities, whether they are diagnosed or not diagnosed, 
to be able to have better environments at the universities. Um, this includes um, wellness rooms, this includes yoga, this includes different types of music therapy, different quiet spaces, et cetera. So I really see um, I really see universities making an effort in this space. Um, so if you have something specific around challenges, I would love to have you um, have additional information. Um, another question. It feels overwhelming to be thinking about how to go to the next level. It can be challenging to understand all the intricacies of the job. How can we, as people working in the field, learn more? Any good resources, websites, articles? It is overwhelming, isn't it? I mean, when you think about the statistic that I shared that um, we had 6% of students who disclosed, you know, who identified as students with disabilities, and now we have 20% of students who are disclosing and identifying as students with disabilities. That is like an unbelievable shift. In a lot of higher ed um, institutions, a lot of the work that is conducted is by paper. Um, so students have their disability paperwork, and it's actually physical copies of things that are going out. So the process itself of what we see with students with disabilities, the management of it, the disability accommodations requests, the communications with professors, et cetera, that's a lot of work, isn't it? And often students will come to us at times when they are really stressed and they are really overwhelmed and that, that difficult things have happened. Um, students come to us, a student maybe had a recent diagnosis and are in the throes of understanding this. And so in addition to all of the workload happening in disability resources departments, there's also an emotional workload that is happening as well. So this all can feel very overwhelming. What I know about people who work in the field and my experience, my individual experience of people working in the field, is that everybody wants to provide students with a welcoming environment and, and wants students to be successful at their university. Um, and everyone wants to be a resource that students can rely on. And so, unfortunately, the best part of the way for us to do that is that we have to sort of stay up on things that are happening. Um, like there is queer theory, like there is critical race theory, um, there is also critical disability studies. And so I highly recommend, and also I have a bias because this is the kind of programming that I teach. Um, I think that having some classes on disability studies in the same vein to understand disability as identity and culture is really important. Um, and sometimes our students need to connect us with those kinds of resources, that there's a whole community out there that you might not be aware of, that you might not be familiar with. Um, so uh, it's kind of, I'm not very good at getting resources and copying them and pasting them into chats and Q&As. Um, I'd be happy to uh, provide some resources to the organizers of the events if you guys want to include these with the materials for um, for this sessions today. Um, what if there was a class such as English or chemistry designated to learning disabilities that is catered to their needs and possibly more one-on-one -on -one time? Hmm, that's a difficult question. Um, so I think where we are today is really trying to identify um, more inclusive environments. Um, certainly in primary and secondary education, we know the laws about least restrictive environments. Um, but education, and especially higher ed, is meant to be more inclusive. Now, 
what some uh, some universities have been doing is creating more specialized peer mentoring programs. And so students with various learning disabilities have the opportunity to have mentors um, to go through materials with them as an additional type of resource. And those programs have been very successful. The students who are in those programs have excellent um, persistence rates, graduation rates, et cetera. And so that has been, um, I think, something that has been tried at a number of universities and has been really successful. So I think my personal perspective would be that's probably um, the way to go. Uh, I just want to note that somebody wrote on the board, yes, please include some resources. So uh, you guys, I'd be happy to do that if there's a way for us to, um, to include that with the materials from this session. Um, what do you think of the role of Centers for Teaching and Learning and Faculty Development Offices? Um, they are terrific partners for all of us to be working with. Um, so. I think that, um, and I'm, this is, I am not an expert in Centers for Teaching and Learning, so I just want to have that as a, you know, a caveat here. This is not my area of expertise, so I'm sort of like talking outside my box. Um, I think there's an excellent opportunity for Centers for Teaching and Learning, and this is where talking about um, universal design and cultural education, that the two of those are happening in these centers for teaching and learning. Um, and this is where instructors are receiving professional development is through centers for teaching and learning. Um, what I would say is often we um, are not including information about disability as diversity. And so I think Centers for Teaching and Learning need to have more of that information in their material. Um, and universal design for learning, I think we need to branch out from the access and start talking about content and have really meaningful conversations about content. I'm going to go back to the example of trigger warnings. And I think trigger warnings is a real concrete example that we all need to wrestle with. One we acknowledge that students are going to be hearing difficult things. Two, we as instructors are acknowledging our place in the history, that we're part of a history that may have perpetuated some of this violence. And three, there is a reality that you can hear difficult things in a class, and part of being professional is figuring out how are you going to navigate that. So it's the perfect example of what is our obligation um, in Centers for Teaching and Learning? What is our obligation as instructors of work that we have to do on our own and representing our professions? And also, what is the obligation of the student in the classroom? So I think it's a trigger warnings are a great example where all of us have a role to play and we could have some really meaningful conversations about that. Um, Emily Frank, thank you for your question. Um, do you encounter situations where faculty respond to requests for accessibility and accommodations as being a lowering of standards? Yes, um, sometimes faculty have considered uh, requests for accessibility and accommodations a lowering of standards. I'm not saying all, um, I'm saying that sometimes faculty don't have an understanding of what accommodations are, and sometimes faculty need more education on the whole accommodation process. Um, I think it's really, you know, I've been wrestling with this for such a long time in my own, you know, my own intellectual process, and it's, I think that it's difficult for people who have not had any lived experience with disability themselves or with a family member. Um, if a person has not had any of the experience, an accommodation itself and a letter for something 
sort of comes out of left field. Um, and more what I see is instructors, professors, faculty struggling with what is the meaning of it and, and what am I really supposed to do here? Often what I see, and other people might have a different experience, is that faculty um, will want to know what's the problem. What's the diagnosis? If I know what the problem is, then I know what I can do about it. And of course, we that is not part of the disclosure process and, and doesn't need to be. Um, but I think that that's also a sign of, of faculty and instructors wanting to help and not knowing how to help. Um, and they feel if they had more information, they could offer some uh, some different ideas. Um, so I think that the answer is, um, first of all, it's not a lowering of standards. Accommodations are not a lowering of standards, but part of it is an educational process with individual instructors and family, faculty to help them understand more about disability, disability rights, and disability culture. How do we as an institution make disability aware teaching classrooms more accessible for part time faculty, especially those who don't have a lot of extra time to dedicate to their teaching? Uh, you know, I think all of us saw this during the pandemic, right? Um, so during the pandemic, everyone, every single one of us was asked to just pivot immediately and to move everything online. And at the time, the resources weren't available. Um, we didn't have universal captioning and universal tools. So I think that um, one of the things that we need to do is also just standardize certain things for classrooms. Um, an individual student may not necessarily need individual transcriptions and being able to have access to live transcriptions for all students can be helpful. And so I think that a question is now that we've all been through this experience of the pandemic, um, how do we really think about what should be standardized in a classroom um, and available to all students without regard for whether or not an individual student, I don't mean it that way, like it doesn't take one student to say they need a transcript when we should be able to uh, provide transcripts for all students. Um, so I think that's part of the conversation that we need to have in higher ed is some of this standardization in classrooms and, and um, design in a classroom that is standardized that makes all classrooms more accessible to all. Megan, um, Megan shared a resource with you, Emily, if you haven't seen on the Q&A board. Um, and Emily, Megan is planning an event that is emphasizing training for disabled individuals through disability simulation courses and um, provides a link to that. So I'm going to jump in with a, if you don't mind, Megan, I'm going to jump in with a comment on um, simulation. So this is one of the topics that is really controversial in disability studies. Um, and so it is controversial because in some cases, disability sim simulations, yeah, simulations, um, actually, as the research would show, in some cases have a negative consequence um, to disabilities. So, for example, um, in a class, there might be a simulation of a wheelchair and what it would be like to be a person in a wheelchair navigating a college campus. And um, in, in one sense, we may think that that is something that um, creates a degree of empathy so that everyone can 
understand what it is and how difficult it might be to navigate a college campus in a wheelchair. Um, but it may also create pity. So feeling sorry for an individual in a wheelchair navigating campus. And not all individuals, and I'm just using this as an example, not all individuals who use a wheelchair on campus um, feel that it is a bad thing. So for some students who use alternative mobility devices, it is a pathway to great freedom. And compared to alternatives that they might have, this might be a great option and they feel terrific about it. Um, and that the dilemma is not necessarily for them in a wheelchair, but maybe the environment that they're in and the difficulties that the campus itself presents. And I just use that as an example of content as we're talking about disability content in the classroom that often the content can have multiple points of view and that's okay. Um, in the example that I gave earlier, um, students with autism who are seeing examples of segregated classrooms or ABA, they may have a different point of view that those things have not been necessarily great or that the autistic community has a different point of view. So when we're looking at content about people with disabilities, I think we have to keep an open mind on how that content may be interpreted and it may not have a universal, singular, one positive response, that it may have a very complex history and a very complicated response to it. Thank you for everyone who put questions in the board. I really appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you doing that. I think presentations are better when they have some degree of interactivity and I respect you as an audience having your own professional perspectives and information that you wanna share. What I'd like to do in the last minute is I just kind of wanna go back to um, back to my material a little bit and leave you with some, you know, leave you with a few thoughts. One of the thoughts that I'd like to leave you with is understanding that, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, you may have a different opinion, I think the pandemic has really been an inflection point for, for everyone, for faculty, for staff, for students. Um, we've certainly seen that in workforce with things like the great resignation, if you're familiar with that term. And people are moving from the idea that because I am here, then I consent to suck it up. Um, the notion of like it or leave it. Um, and for people who don't have all of the options and the privilege of a lot of options, that means I have to suck it up because I can't afford to leave it. I've made an investment in this thing. I've made an investment in the school. I've made a financial investment. Um, and so I can't just walk away. And people have really been moving their idea forward, not only in terms of their individual self-disclosure, but also saying things and speaking up on behalf of others. Um, and so people are beginning to stand their ground. And I certainly have seen a lot more students come forward and talk not only about the accommodations or lack of accommodations, welcoming spaces, but also on things like content and implicit ableism or systemic ableism that they're seeing in universities, in their classrooms, in their curriculum, in policies, et cetera. And I think that that's really important. Um, we often move away from the language of disability, saying person first language, people with disabilities, for example. And all of this movement is also part of generating this movement of disability pride, hashtag say the word, and hashtag disabled. 
Um, and so I think this shift is really, really important for us. And the last thing um, that I want to leave you with is just this example um, as something simple we can each do. Um, how do we, when we're presenting syllabi and we're presenting curriculum of various sorts, webinars, information, how do we acknowledge the reality of the history of where we are? Um, how do we acknowledge what might happen in a conversation and that there's a reality that can happen in the conversation that may be harmful to some of the people who are sitting there? Um, and then what does this mean in terms of conversations about trigger warnings, for example? So um, that is really the wrap up of my presentation. I'm hoping as a result of this conversation, um, we as a field will start thinking about not only access and accommodations, we will also start thinking about physical spaces and environments. Um, we will think about what does it take to make people feel welcomed and that can be in the content, the information that we share and the examples that we use. Um, and that's really the end of my presentation today. Let me um, stop sharing, make sure I got everything picked up on the Q&A. Yep, I caught up on the Q&A. And Rashmi, I would like to turn it back to you. Thank you, Kate, for this great presentation today. Uh, for everyone, the presenter slides and recording of the session will be available on the Wine Garden website in a few days. Just give us a few days to make sure we have recorded everything correctly. And we hope that you will join us for our next session on Thursday, March 24th. And the title is Born Since the ADA student activism and leadership panel by one of our Penn students, Cypress Mars. So keep your uh, time open, March 24th. We hope to see you again. And thank you, Kate. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today.